Good morning to our respected delegates from the British High Commission and Trade Forward Southern Africa. And a very, very good morning to our dear participants. Thank you all for finding time and attending today's International Trade with the United Kingdom webinar. My name is Leah Cherian, and I'm responsible for export development at CEDA. I will be your facilitator for today. Therefore, a hearty welcome to all. Before we proceed, just a few house rules. May I kindly inform that the link for today's webinar and the presentations will be sent to each individual that registered for this webinar. Next, we would love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please feel free to send it to the Q&A box only at the bottom of your screen. We do not want it to get lost amongst the chat. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. General comments can be made in the chat session. In order for us to improve our webinars, we value your input. Therefore, after the presentations, we will be doing a quick question poll. I urge each of you to please complete it. And last, we'd like to encourage you to share today's webinar and its information with your social networks. Please include hashtag CEDA at the end. If you would like a specific topic to be presented on which relates to export development, please feel free to suggest it in the chat box. Your needs as an SMME is very important to us and we at CEDA strive to be of assistance to you and your business. Without further ado, I now call Mr. Ambrose Makhwale, Manager for the Program Management Unit at CEDA, to give us the official opening for the webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Charian, for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to affably welcome you to today's webinar, especially our respective present presenters. It is a, indeed a pleasure to have all of you affording us your audience, leaving your busy schedules to be with us this morning. Once again, I would like to welcome you. Uh, international trade is one of the leading discussions taking place not only in South Africa, but all over the world. The major concern is always about the level of economic growth. South Africa has long standing and extensive trade relations with the UK. The United Kingdom is one of South Africa's key trade partners, and this remains so during the COVID-19 pandemic. Through cycles of social distancing measures, lockdowns in both countries, the UK remains both a main destination and source market for South Africa. Although the lockdowns have affected the value and composition of South Africa's UK trade, for 2019, the UK ranked the fifth destination market for South African exports and the seventh source market for imports. For 2020, the UK remains the fifth ranked destination, but drops to the 10th ranked source market. In 2019, South Africa, Lesotho, Eswatini, Namibia, and Botswana, which formed the South African, uh, Southern African Customs Union, briefly known as SACU and Mozambique, concluded a new trade deal with UK to ensure that their exports to the UK can continue seamlessly post-Brexit. We refer to that as SACUM UK, Economic Partnership Agreement. This creates an environment to preserve current trading conditions. Trade, specifically exporting, allows SMMEs to reach bigger markets and learn new skills that increase their profitability and raises consumption for firm owners workers and their families. CEDA is mandated to support SMMEs to engage in more international trade. Initiatives such as the international trade webinars that CEDA hosts ensure that the South African SMMEs have access to information and possible markets to explore. I hope you will enjoy this webinar and basically use this information that you will receive today to explore the UK market and on that note, I would like to thank you. Over to you, Madam Cherian. Thank you very much, Mr. Makhwale, for that introduction and setting the tone for a very informative session. Trade by SMMEs are a vital engine in the Southern African economy. They drive growth, create employment, especially among youth and spearhead innovation. 
Through trade, South African SMMEs play a key role in the global value chain and supply essential goods and services to various parts of the world, which in turn helps to keep the wheels of the economy in motion. The lack of knowledge about foreign markets is often mentioned as the key obstacle to export. In order to provide us with market information in the UK, I will now introduce Mr. Charlie Morris, who is the Trade Policy Advisor at the British High Commission. He will also be touching on the agreement the UK has signed with the Southern African Customs Union and Mozambique. Mr. Morris, a pleasure having you on board and I hand the platform over to you, sir. Thank you uh, very much, um, Madam Chair. Um, I just uh, want to do a quick check with my microphone to ensure that uh, you can hear me uh, and that I'm visible on my screen. Yes, you are, sir. Thank you. Well, um, the, the, thank you to you and to the Small Enterprise Development Agency, to CEDA, and, and to everyone who's here. Um, it's wonderful to see such a fantastic turnout today. Um, I think there are 280 people I can see on the call and counting, and I think I think that's going up. And you know, that, I think that's a remarkable display of what kind of appetite there is to uh, trade with the UK and other nations and the recognition of the importance that it has in economic development here in South Africa. Um, and I think that's particularly so impressive because we've very, uh, faced a very challenging context over the past few years with respect to trade, um, certainly to do with COVID um, and supply chain disruptions all over the world, which may, many people here will know about. Uh, also, how COVID has affected both capital and commodity markets um, and how that affects appetites for trade, I think, has been especially difficult for stable import-export relationships that have been very difficult. Wider contextual factors uh, mean that we're having to keep up with an ever-changing landscape uh, on trade, whether that's the increasing importance of sustainable trade and the necessity to meet private standards in uh, European and uh, developed markets, whether it's the increased emphasis on digitization or cross-border data, data flows and compliance with, with that, or whether, and I think this is something we'll I'll touch on quite a lot of my presentation, whether it's specific changes to the rules and regulations with certain countries that may have come uh, about as a result of things like Brexit. Um, and that's what I hope to do today in this presentation. And I think the introduction um, before me was um, a, a really um, uh, excellent summary of the, the importance of trade, some of the challenges that we've been facing and why we're here. Um, and I think that is to break down barriers to information because I know from the perspective of a small business that um, you know, you've you've set up, you may have been a sole, tra sole trader, you're starting to explore your own domestic market, you're getting some success there, but then you start to look, look overseas and suddenly the array of different rules, different regulations, different market conditions can often be incredibly confusing. And that's why I'm so grateful to see that for putting on events like this that give us an opportunity to break down those barriers to information and hopefully share uh, some uh, some of that with you. Um, the, the trade relationship between the UK and South Africa is incredibly important to both, both governments, to the South African government and to the UK government. Uh, the latest figures up to Q3 2021 stand at 11 billion for that trading relationship, um, which remarkably is an increase of 35% um, on the four quarters preceding that, a 35% increase in terms of trade volumes, which I suppose there's there's a few ways you might be able to look at that. The, the pessimists um, uh, among, uh, amongst us might say, well, that's just going back to back to where it was. That's just rebounding after after COVID um, and a real um, decrease in the volumes of uh, of, of trade. Um, but the optimist in me would say, and this is certainly what I think, is that we are relaunching the, the, those trade links. They have bounded back very quickly. Those figures are now higher than ever. And I think that's testament to businesses in bo both countries about the appetite to reestablish the, those trade links and get, get them growing again. 
Um, and it is it. It is a mature, complicated trading relationship in both directions that I think brings immense value to both UK and South African business consumers and investors. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here today to hopefully help to grow that relationship um, even further. Um, I hope there are lots of lot, lots of people on this call. I mean, the reason why people attended is because they're interested in growing trade with the UK. So um, I hope I don't have to do a, a big sales job on why, why that's a good thing, but let me just give it a go for a few minutes anyway, that there are fantastic opportunities for trade and export with, with the UK that I think all businesses who are thinking about exporting should be considering. The shared language, the same time zone, great air connections, large diaspora communities, access to skills, capital markets, innovation, amongst many, many other things, make the UK a fantastic place to do business with and consider where to start that, that exporting journey, as well as the fact of having a really advantageous trading framework with which to start, uh, start that um, re relationship. And that's what I want to turn to now. So I'm going to talk broadly about two things in this presentation. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the UK, SACU and Mozambique Economic Partnership Agreement. I'm going to talk about some of the substance of that agreement and then the practicalities of trading under that agreement. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about some of the other practicalities for trading with the UK outside of the economic partnership agreement, because of course, preferences are only one, um, one input to that equation on trading. There are many other rules, regulations that I know can sometimes be, uh, be confusing. I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about those before handing over to my colleague, Rob Moody. He's gonna present some fantastic tools that we are, have available to again, help break down some of those barriers to information to enable you to trade, uh, trade further. So I'll go straight into it, into the um, economic, economic partnership agreement. Um, of course, when it comes to preferential trade, it, the actual number of preferential trading arrangements that South Africa has with the rest of the world um, are comparatively few uh, in some respects. Um, AGOA, the um, African Growth and Opportunity Act that enables exports to America is of course is a huge one. Um, the SADC region in and of, it, of itself, but outside Africa, when it comes to the Mercosur, a lot of uni uh, other unilateral preferences, and then really you have the EU and the UK economic, economic partnership agreements. And I wanted to start with that context because it is a huge advantage for South African uh, exporters. It gives that preferential access and that price competitiveness when exporting to the UK market compared to other countries. Um, and vice versa in bo both directions. And so I think it's natural that many people would want to look there first in order to start their exporting journey. These agreements are very, very important um, to everyone, to businesses, consumers, investors, and particularly to, the, to governments, to us as a UK government. That's why we took the decision back in 2016 to replicate all our free trade agreements that we previously participated in as members of the EU. Um, and we put a huge amount of effort into doing so because we knew the importance that the users of the, those agreements attached to them. And that's why I'm very pleased that across the African continent, across Sub-Saharan Africa, we were able to replicate every single one of the, those trade agreements with Sub-Saharan African partners. Um, and that was a real achievement and assure, uh, ensures that even after the UK left the European Union, when the preferential trading agreements that we were previously part of as part of the EU ceased to apply, those relationships were able to continue with the same term, terms of trade attached. So to give a little bit of context about, about the agreement, the UK SACU and Mozambique Economic Partnership Agreement is a full development focused asymmetric free trade agreement that gives extensive preferences to trading goods between the UK and South Africa. It is a goods only uh, agreement, um, although there is between the UK and South Africa, a bilateral protocol 
uh, on geographical indications. So that means if you're an exporter of things like wine, that will that sort of thing will uh, will apply to you there, or wine or rooibos tea, for instance. Um, good it applies to almost all goods from South Africa. About 96 to 97 percent of goods receive duty-free quota-free access to the UK market, with the remaining three to four percent of those receiving preferential access in some form for most of those, whether that's through slightly reduced duties or whether that's through um, tariff rate quotas. All of the information about exactly what preferences apply to which goods is available via the UK government website. And that's again, something that Rob will be talking through later about the gateway to access some of that, that information and how you can very, very e easily find it. It does not cover uh, trade-in services. Uh, it does not cover digital goods. It does not cover public uh, public procurement, unfortunately, at the moment. But of course, if you are someone who is involved in things like trade-in services, whether you are know, looking at legal services, accounting services, you run a fintech company and want to explore doing businesses in the UK, that can, of course, all happen anyway uh, under the current trading regime. Uh, the lack of free trade agreement in that space doesn't mean that that trade can't happen. It just means you will need to go and explore the rules and regulation on that available. But again, that is all available on the gov.uk website where you can find rule reports about, you know, exactly what standards of compliance you need to meet for those kind of those kind of things. And um, just while I, before I go on to just explain some of the other practicalities for trading with the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, I'm seeing a really lively chat bar going on. Please do ask lots and lots of questions there. Hopefully I'll be able to get, get to them at the end. Um, I don't know whether, Leo, you know, maybe you can um, take some of, some of those so I can hopefully answer them at the end, or maybe we'll address them all in the q and I'll leave the exact running of them to you, but please do uh, ask as many questions as you want, and I will um, try and try and get around to them at the end. So secondly, just some of the practicalities of trading under the Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, the, the main one that people need to be aware of, I think, for the purposes of this presentation, is around rules of origin. Um, now, some people, of course, on the, this will have lots and lots of experience of using preferences to uh, trade with other countries and they'll know exactly what rules of origin are. Maybe it's the first time you've heard about things like uh, like rules of origin. Uh, so I'll just do a little bit of an explanation about, uh, about what that is. I want to ensure that everyone gets the information that they, uh, they need. Um, rules of origin uh, essentially are the um, conditions within trade agreements that guarantee that goods going from South Africa to the UK are actually goods that were produced in South Africa. They are South African good, goods going, and they're not just goods that, for instance, have been imported from some other country that doesn't have an agreement with the, with the UK and then just shipped to ships on onwards. They are essentially the, the key that unlocks the preferences within the agreement that you need to know uh, in order to be able to trade. They can and are, and are highly complicated. Um, and so I would always re recommend if you are someone who operates a very complex value chain um, with respect to your exports that you should always seek professional advice. But in general, goods either need to be wholly obtained, uh, i.e. for instance, you know, if you grow uh, citrus here in South Africa, um, and for your oranges, everything about your oranges, you know, the, the, the fruit uh, or the, the seeds, whatever it might, might be, the fertilizer, that all comes from South Africa. Those goods are wholly obtained here, and that would mean you would meet the rules of origin to be able to export. Um, or they need to be substantially transformed. Uh, they need to undergo some substantial transformation, some substantial processing or working on those goods uh, in order to, uh, to qualify. Again, when you get into areas like substantial transformation, that's where it's really important you know exactly what the conditions are for your particular goods that you're exporting. Um, you will need a certificate of origin to be able to qualify for preferences. Um, and you can obtain these from SARS, from your local chambers of commerce, or from other designated authorities in South Africa. 
that are able to uh, produce certi certificates of origin. Um, so that is a very regular um, document that people will have that enables that when you get to the UK border, that says this is a good that has definitely come from South Africa. It is granted this preferential access instead of paying the 10, 20% tariff or whatever it is that uh, might apply. There are provisions in the agreement designed to facilitate more complex value chains. Um, and that's what we refer to when you say, um, when we say provisions on accumulation. So if you have ch supply chains that span across particularly the EU uh, or even elsewhere in Southern Africa, that's something that the agreement is designed to facilitate and promote to enable you to be able to export. But again, if you are someone with those kind of value chains, yeah. those kind of supply chains, I would always recommend seeking specialist advice to ensure you've got the right documentation, the right evidence to uh, um, to prove that you meet those uh, the, those rules of origin. So finally, I'm going to go on to some other practicalities of trading with the UK, um, and I want to talk about a few different things. So. In almost all cases of exports, there are certain regulatory and procedural hurdles that you will need to undertake. Um, and exactly what you need to do and what you are responsible for in particular will depend, uh, will differ depending on the particular relationship with your importer on the UK side. So you should always seek to clarify who is responsible for each of the individual elements and each of the um, bits of documentation. But in broad terms, after the 1st of January 2021, the UK government's priority was to ensure a smooth functioning of trade that between the UK and the rest of the world would continue. And that means, with the exception of some limited changes, the requirements to export goods to the UK remains mostly the same as of 1st of January 2021 as it was of before. So we have not instituted big major changes with respect to those regulatory hurdles. Um, it is important to say that we've always been clear as a government that part of the rationale for leaving the EU is establishing our own regulatory independence and a trading regime that makes sense for the UK's individual circumstances rather than in the EU. And as such, it's crucial that you always do your own due diligence on what those certifications and requirements are before you start uh, the, before you start that part of your export journey. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, um, as agricultural trade is such an important part um, of that, um, that that relationship between our countries. It's important to say we remain firmly committed to upholding high environmental, food safety, and animal welfare standards outside the EU. Uh, so when we left, the EU Withdrawal Act transferred all EU food safety, animal health, and plant protection provisions at the moment of exit onto the UK statute books, which means, again, the protections and mechanisms that were in place pre previously largely still are. There are some important differences that, in order to point out um, and those are particularly about the decisions about certain plant and animal health controls now being made for the UK rather than the UK and the EU. So, for example, uh, with respect to citrus products, because, of course, the UK is not a major grower of citrus, we have deregulated exports of citrus products, which means that a phytosanitary certificate is not needed uh, when importing such products to the UK. Uh, which I know uh, is very important to lots of producers of citrus products here and makes those exports much, much easier. There are some different certificates, systems and processes that you will need to be aware of in XVR exporting such products. So for instance, certain products of animal origin and live animals, there are slightly different model health certificates. The phytosanitary certificates, which are largely determined by international standards, they remain the same for plants, but again, it will check on your. In, uh, it will depend on your individual circumstances as to whether these are the responsibility of yourselves or of the importer. Uh, if there are any people involved in the wine in industry here, um, that's something that's fantastic. Uh, I know very well that consumers in the UK love to enjoy South African wine, 
And you should be aware of that from the start of this year, uh, the VI1 certification process for wine is no longer required, which we estimate will reduce the cost of each bottle in the UK by around 13 pence, which again provides an important comparative advantage for wine sold elsewhere other than the UK. With respect to plant products of animal origin and live animals that go through the EU, these are subject to different requirements and there is a different system in place where checks are being phased in with respect to goods coming from the EU. So if this does apply to you, you will need to check this guidance very carefully and that can be, um, that can be much more complicated. Next, I just want to talk about some of the other regulatory requirements that of course exist. We don't have time to go through all of these, these now, um, but these are product specific. So if you export manufactured goods, medical devices, chemo, chemicals, or even I don't know, things like nuclear waste, these all have very different requirements. And this will affect particularly the label, marking, marketing rules for all of these products, and even some certain testing that you'll need to go through before you export to the UK again guidance available online for all of these product categories and it will also depend on your own supply chain arrangements whether this is completed in the UK or in uh, South Africa. Finally just a brief word on trading with the trading where value chains go between the EU um, some that will differ depending on your particular value chain so in which direction, whether it goes from here to the EU to the UK, or from here to the UK to the EU and back. Um, each of those directions will mean different rules and different checks that you will need to consider. So for example, products of our, uh, animal origin going through the EU and onwards to the UK. Uh, so let's say if you have a distribution hub located somewhere in the EU, you may be subject to two sets of checks that you have to meet for relatory uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards rather than one as before, as it would be exactly the same as if you were going through another third country before onwards to the EU. I would certainly recommend specialist legal advice or consulting your clearing agent or freight forwarder in such complex cases to determine what you need to do to comply with such regulations. I will finish off there just a couple of very uh, very brief words about so, some other platforms again rob's going to point, point you in the direction of all uh, lots of these but just two things that i want to point out that have been recent initiatives by the uk government so the first is the deal room um, which we launched at the uh, african investment conference in 2021 uh, and then i think uh, got a proper launch in 2022 this is something where um, if you, you are a business here in South Africa or indeed elsewhere in the African continent, you can seek investment for your project from, from UK investors. Um, and that can be investment on different firms, whether you're just seeking particular uh, a line, a line of credits for, for investment or whether you want an equity investment in your firm, you can go, go to that site. The thresholds are a little higher, so they might not be applicable for all small um, small business businesses. It might be for those a little bit more advanced in their relationship. We've currently got three projects we're supporting in South Africa. Um, there's an expansion of citrus farming in the Western Cape, uh, sorry, the Eastern Cape rather, um, a project about fuel storage in, in Lesotho, where we're investing in storage collection facilities across the continent. Um, some really exciting projects there. So again, that might be applicable to you if you're that kind of enterprise looking for that sort of investment. Um, and the final one is Grok the Gateway, um, which will be a single access point for businesses in Af Africa that want to export and invest in the UK. Lots of the information available by Grok the Gateway is also available via the Trade Forward Southern Africa Hub. There will be additional things that you might be able to access, such as being able to be linked directly with buyers in the UK for your particular products. Again, you can go, go on search online, get in touch with the Growth Gateway team if that's of interest to you. It is in a little bit of a pilot phase at the moment. So the full service for Growth Gateway hasn't been rolled out. But again, you can see after looking at um, Trade Forward Southern Africa, all of the, those tools, which one's right for you to help you to, um, to export. Okay, I hope that was helpful. It's been lovely to talk to you uh, all today. I'll obviously be around for any questions. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know whether we're doing questions now or questions at the end. I will, um, but I will hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. You've given us certainly a lot to think about and a lot, a lot to prepare for. We will do the question and answers after uh, Mr. Moody's presentation also. May I please request all those that are addressing questions in the chat box to please address them in the Q&A box um, that you'll find at the bottom. And another thing is that I know that a lot of the, the participants are requesting for the attendance register because I know you wanna do business, but sadly due to the, due to the Poppy Act, we are not allowed to share our um, attendance registers because it has information about our participants which cannot be shared um, without their permission. So may I request you to please engage with those um, colleagues, I mean participants on the chat session and please put all your questions in the Q&A box. Once again, Mr. Morris, I thank you for your time and uh, to the British High Commission for their support uh, in, in ensuring that this webinar has been a success. And I, like you said, seeing the numbers has certainly indicated that um, it was well um, advertised and we will be having a poll session at the end. So based on that poll, we will know whether we were effective. So we've got two hurdles to jump over before we know whether this webinar was a success. But thank you again, sir. I had the good fortune of hearing about Trade Forward Southern Africa and my antenna sparked up when hearing of all they offer for SMMEs in the Southern part of Africa. Their objective is to support companies that are exporting or near export ready. And furthermore, this is the part where my toes were tingling with excitement when I heard that their primary emphasis focuses on promoting women's participation in export trade. Now, ladies, how does that sound? We have the She Trades program that CEDA offers. And now to add on to that, Mr. Robert Moody, the lead technical expert will be presenting on the offerings of Trade Forward Southern Africa and, give us a, and will be giving us a live demonstration as he navigates through the webpage of the School of Export. Mr. Moody, you certainly know how to pick our interest. And without further ado, let me hand it over to you to enlighten us of this great initiative. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, lovely opportunity to engage with companies that have gone through the CEDA process and are in the CEDA network. It's the exact target companies that we're trying to reach, companies that haven't yet broken into the export markets, but are poised to venture internationally to internationalize your business. So uh, just a quick introduction of Trade Forward Southern Africa, as um, Charlie has said, funded by the UK government. And uh, Charlie and I often do a bit of a tag team exercise. Uh, Charlie does this magnificent um, talk and presentation about the trading relationships and opportunities with the UK, particularly now that we have the economic partnership agreement in place. And he's a mine of information and understanding of how these agreements and this particular agreement works. Um, they are very complicated for exporters to actually navigate around, but that is part of the role of Trade Forward Southern Africa. Our role is primarily to help companies overcome the non-tariff barriers. Now, what is a non-tariff barrier? Just a bit of background, you know, the, 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 historically, Countries used to protect their local economies by putting up a uh, tariff that made it uncompetitive when a product landed in the market. And over time, through the World Trade Organization and bilateral agreements, the focus on um, customs duties has reduced. So that very often, and a classic example, the economic partnership agreement, as Charlie will have said, is that almost all products from the region, including South Africa, will go into the UK with a 0% customs duty. Now that is, a, the, the customs duties were tariff barriers, but there are other barriers that are not customs duty tariff related. And our role at TFSA is to try to help companies navigate through this minefield, and it can be a minefield as Charlie's already said, of barriers and re compliance requirements that you, you have to meet in order to get a product into a market. So what we did as TFSA is we set up a trade and information hub and I'll share my screen shortly and I'll go through it with you just to indicate exactly what resources are there to help you overcome 
probably the first and biggest non-tariff barrier barrier to, to to getting into the export business and that is where do i start and where do i get information about the rules that i have to comply with and the hurdles that i have to jump um, what we did is we started as almost as a, a sequence when you know putting yourself in the shoes of a business that is well established in the local market and then thinking to export where do you start? Start at the beginning. Don't jump in it halfway through. So um, it's we, we've set it up to follow this sequence from beginning thinking through to actually getting your product on some sort of transport and shipped overseas and cleared through to a market overseas. And our focus today will be on the UK. Um, Getting information is often very complex. Um, you can Google, you can search on the internet, and you never know whether you're getting the right thing, if it's current, if it's up to date, if it's accurate. And you know there are lots of organizations that, that hold information that are repositories of, of information, but information has its, its own value. And very often there are gatekeepers that, who, who, who protect that information. So our role is to try to get you past gatekeepers and get you past the challenges of getting to the right information. With that, let me show my screen and I will do a quick demonstration of what we are offering to help exporters through this minefield known as the export endeavor. Um, I've already put the, uh, the link to our uh, trade and information hub in the chat bar. I'll post it again just now for anybody who's missed it so far. And I cannot stress strongly enough, I really, really encourage anybody who's looking to export and doesn't know where to start, go to the uh, TFSA trade and information hub, and I'll show you the steps that you can go through to get the information that you're seeking. Um, starting off on our home page that is up in front of you, I trust everybody can see that. Leo, if it's not coming up, please let me know, but I'll go on the basis that everybody is seeing it. Can see it? So, okay, super. Thanks, Leo. Look, it's set up very much the way a normal website is set up, but there are some uh, extra tweaks and facilities that we've built into it, and we're improving it on a weekly basis as we go forward. This is in actual fact the second iteration that we've had since we set it up about a year ago, just over a year ago, and we just found that there was more that we could do. And with feedback that we got, we've upgraded it. So if you come to the landing page, the home page, um, you don't have to go to the country links. We've done it because we cover all six countries in the Southern African Customs Union and Mozambique. And you know, people can link in from their country according to you know the, the home page there. But the, each one of those links will also bring you through to these key areas. So the process of you know when you when you've got your business nicely set up and you start to look to internationalize in some way or another, it's a case of am I ready? So that's the first thing. You've got to be comfortable that you are ready, that your company is in reasonable shape. So on this home page. This is the very first thing that we built in as an export readiness checker. And you'll see here, it goes through your management readiness, your market intelligence readiness, your production readiness, your resources, your suppliers, your, your financial resources, your actual operations readiness, and where you are in getting your export plan ready. And you can see it's very interactive. You can click on the different things here, and it will actually come through and give you a conclusion on each one of these elements of how close to being export ready you are or what areas of your business you need to focus on to strengthen where you might have weaknesses. Um, once you've got into a situation, you feel that you're reasonably comfortable, your product is easily adaptable, there's going to be a good demand for it in, in, you know, in international markets based on how you've been received in your local market. You then sit and think, okay, but um, where do I export to? And unfortunately, I've, I've been in, well, not unfortunately, but reality, I've been in this business for, I, you can see by the gray of the beard, probably uh, just over 40 years now, helping companies export. 
And these are processes that I've gone through with companies over and over again, over decades. And it's a similar pattern that occurs. Once you're ready, you say, well, where do I export? Um, you know, your, your interest might have been sparked because a relative living overseas or you've got some sort of random query that came through. Um, but that's not the best way to identify where you should be exporting. You might find better markets elsewhere than where you've got a relative living. So what we've done is we've brought in the tools of the International Trade Center. Um, again, on our home page, all that you do is you click on that link. I've opened up pages in advance already. It will bring you through to the market, to the export potential map of the uh, International Trade Center. And I've opened this up already. Um, you can use these tools usually to about the four digit of the HS code level. I would strongly encourage anybody who's looking to find markets to identify where your opportunities are to actually go and register in the ITC facility because it opens up an enormous amount of information, guidance, training, and so on. And the International Trade Center, for your information, is a joint venture between the WTO and the United Nations. It is the apex organization in the world trying to help grow exports from developing countries. So if you register in it, you can go onto it. And I just used a quick example for South Africa. You know, you, you could use this, you could change it for your country, but we're with a South African audience today, so I fixed it at South Africa. You can change the products here. You'll see here, if you put a drop down, you can change the product that you, for your, your particular company, this is where it becomes much more valuable than an overall look at what exports could go from South Africa to the UK. If you're a producer of cosmetics, you really have little interest of what the opportunity is for the citrus industry or the automotive industry. Or I've used an example here of automotive industry. You have little interest in what the market is for oranges or cosmetics in the United Kingdom. You want to know what is the opportunity somewhere in the world for my product, that you, the specific product you manufacture. So I used ignition wiring sets for vehicles here. You can change this as you wish, and it will bring up. Now it uses trade data that is gathered from every single country in the world, import and export trade data. And it actually does the mirror difference between, you know, if you it's declared on an FOB basis in South Africa, in the UK, it's you know, processed through customs on the CIF basis. So there's a difference, in, and it uses mirror data on that as well, as brings in other issues of the regulatory compliance hurdles, how complicated it is in a market, and even the actual geographical physical distance from where you are to a particular market. And you'll see it brings up for South African exporter of ignition wire, uh, wiring sets from motor vehicle industry to supply into the automotive industry in the UK, for example, it, with any country, and it'll bring up where are your key markets. So the statistics identify that Germany is the top market. It will bring up to you what is the export potential, what is the actual exports at the moment, and the potential additional exports that could be won by a producer of ignition wiring sets from South Africa in Germany. And you'll see the UK comes up here as the fifth strongest market um, for a producer of that product. The export potential is another 375,000. There are only $62,000 worth going to the UK at the moment. So there is scope to increase the market share from South Africa in the UK by $312,000. Now, this is statistical. There are obviously all sorts of other factors of, you know, connections to supply chains, who the, the, the potential buyers are there, are you, you know, up to the homologation standards for the UK and so on and so forth, but we'll help you with that as well. But this is the first step to identify what markets. So if somebody had for some reason or other, you have a you, you're manufacturing ignition wiring set, you have a relative is with... Uh, um, one of the producers, the, manuf the auto manufacturers in the UK and says there's a good opportunity. Well, this shows you that indeed there is a decent opportunity. Now, maybe, you know, 
in your in terms of your own production scale, this is a better opportunity than the than the German market, which would be expecting a much bigger supply volume than you could supply. This statistic, these data, this data really does give you exceptionally good feel for where you should be turning your export attention to. Um, once you've done that, um, your next stage is what are the trading prices? Am I reasonably in the ballpark for the trading prices? Um, and you can use these tools. I'll click on this one here. Um, you can set it up again and it brings through to you. You can put in the exporter or in, 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 in the product, the United Kingdom market, and it will tell you what the UK is trading. Now, the very valuable point about this is if you click on this unit value per unit, I'm sorry, this often happens with the leaving pages open too long. I'll try to get back. Sorry about the hiccup on that. Um, if you click through on this, this um, column here, I'll try it again now and hopefully it will work. No, I'm sorry, but you can click on that. And uh, once you've logged in and you haven't left it open too long, it will sort everything by that column of the unit dollar, the, the dollar value per unit of the product that you are dealing with. And you can change that to any product that you want that according to the HS system. So you could put in any of these codes that you are a producer of and it'll bring up and it'll tell you, are you price competitive in that market or not? Um, there is another facility that is um, related to agricultural products, soft products mostly. Um, the links are on the, the page that, uh, of the trade in, uh, TFSA uh, Trade and Information Hub. And this it will just show you, for example, I use the example of cashew nuts. And you can see it actually gives you the country of origin and the pricing over time. So you, 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 you could work out what is your potential pricing in the market and you'll be able to see, are you reasonably price competitive with, with other competitors in the market? Now, going back to our front home page there, the same kind of thing, that same facility will actually bring up um, we're showing the table of the trade data before. If you clicked on this company's tab, it will actually bring up potential importers of that product in the UK. And if you click on that, it's, I'm sorry, <laughs> I set this up yesterday evening and uh, it, it, this is frustrating. Um, it brings up a page for you um here we go we'll bring it up there and i am logged in already apologies for that i set it up and tested it again this morning but i i was in other meetings and an hour's delay meant that it kicked me out um so here it, you can see it on the companies tab it will bring up a list of potential companies now, depending on your product, there might be very few potential uh, partners for you. There might be very many food products and so on. You'll find a lot of companies, something specialized. I used, again, the wiring harnesses for the automotive industry. If you click on a company, you'll see it'll actually bring up the company name, where it is located. It'll give you the company website. It'll give you a telephone number. It will actually even give you an executive's name that you can contact. It'll tell you what the turnover of the business is and how many employees they have working for them, and then the range of products that they deal with. And you'll see here, it indicates whether it is a producer or an importer. You see distributor, producer, service supplier, importer, or an exporter. And in the case of this company, it's a producer and importer. So that gives you a good lead on people that you can contact. Um, sorry, I'm running through this very fast because there's a massive information there and it does take a bit of time for you to go through. So I, that's why I set these up in advance. Now, there are other facilities that we've built in to um, provide help. There is the Center for Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries based in the Netherlands. They have exceptionally good information and tools 
on the various um, markets in the EU. Now, although the UK has left the EU, this has been going for many, many years, so you'll still find a lot of very good information, hints and tips on how to deal with buyers. Sorry, I just brought it up there. If you clicked on the link, it's, I don't worry about the link. You'll find it in the TFSA Trade and Information Hub. It will bring up a thing on market information. You can see the range of market information. And I just opened one, for example, on health products going to Europe. And you see what is the demand, the trends and opportunities. So a lot of the trends and opportunities in Europe will be very similar to the UK. And in actual fact, most of the information still does cover the UK as well. You'll see that there's specific studies on particular products and there are leads to how to deal with buyers, how to find buyers, where to find buyers at trade shows and so on. And it even gives you guidance on how to attend trade shows for the best impact. Now, once you've, uh, apologies, once you've gone through that process, you are now in a space where, okay, you now need to get your product ready for the UK market or for global markets. But our focus today is the UK markets. And again, on our homepage, as I say, it's very simple and easy to find just on our homepage, what are the compliance requirements for my product? So there is a, um, it will bring you through to this page on the, the Trade and Information Hub, and you'll see the resources there to identify these rules globally by the ITC. There's a tool that we've built in specifically from the European Union, and to, for today's interest, specifically this link to the UK, what we call the UK Trade Help Desk, and it will bring you through to this very simple tool. And you can see it is really absolutely simple. You just type in South Africa and you go through it. You put in your product. I've already put it, opened one up already for export of um, shelled cashew nuts from South Africa to the UK. And this is where I, I have to give kudos to the British government, the UK Department for International Trade, on having put together an absolutely outstanding resource for use by exporters from outside the UK who want to export to the UK. So you can, this is again, Charlie's given you the overview of the uh, trading arrangements and the economic partnership agreement, but a producer of a specific product, you need to know what does that mean for me, my company and my product. And it will bring you through then to the trade status. It'll tell you that there's a trade agreement with South Africa. If you didn't happen to know that, but Charlie's informed you of it, you could go there and find out more about it. And there's a whole section then on the tariffs and taxes. This is the customs duties and taxes that will be applied to your product when it enters the UK. As Charlie says, the majority of the products from South Africa going into the UK will enter the UK with a 0% customs duty if, and this is a very important rider, if you have the certificate of origin that indicates the product has met the rules of origin for that specific product. And the rules of origin, as Charlie said, are very, very complicated. They vary according to product category. Um, some categories, you know, like live animals and, and food, um, citrus, uh, fruit products and so on. If they are, if the animal was born in South Africa or if the food, the, the fruit product was grown and harvested in South Africa, that would be, 100%, yes, it would comply with the rules of origin. Others, you have slightly different rules, and you'll see this as I go down here. So third country, there is a 0% duty on cashew nuts from third countries going to the UK, and from South Africa, it is also. So in that context, you don't have that um, agreement that provides a tariff comparative advantage, but this changes according to each product. So 
automotive components or, or other products going into the UK from other countries would very often have a, a duty on them, whereas coming from South Africa, there would be zero duty on them. That gives you a comparative um, advantage. There is a 0% VAT on importation into the UK on that. Some products do have VAT applied to them. And then other products, for example, alcohol, as Charlie mentioned, wine and spirits, there would also be a, uh, an excise duty. And this tool would, sh would bring that up for you so that you can clearly see what the customs duty is that Europe uh, would, would, your product would pay into the UK, what the customs duty of the same product would be from another country to see if you have a comparative advantage and it will tell you what the VAT and or other excise tax might be. It will then go through to the rules of origin for this very specific product, cashew nuts, shelled cashew nuts under this HS code. And anybody who knows anything about export, you know that this HS code is a crucial thing in all of your documentation around exporting. So you'll see here, for this specific product that is shelled cashew nuts. That is the description of the product. And then how non-originating materials must be worked or processed to get the country of origin status. So for this product, all of the materials of chapter eight, that is the fruits and nuts are wholly obtained from within South Africa. So if it is raw shelled um, cashew nuts, they must all be South African. Um, in the agreement with the EU, uh, UK, if they were from the other countries in the Southern African Customs Union, that would also be eligible. So um, cashew nuts coming in from Mozambique could be consolidated with South African cashew nuts and exported. But then if, for example, you have um, your cashew nuts are coated in a barbecue spice or sugar coated uh, or something like that, then all of the fruit and all of the, the, the cashew nuts must be wholly obtained locally. And then the value of any of the additional um, flavorings and coatings and uh, additives, that's chapter 17, should not exceed 30% of the value. So if you are a cashew nut producer, you want to export it to the UK. If it's going shell to the UK, there must all be from South African and Saku or Mozambique origin. If you are putting flavorings and coatings on them, then you can only have a maximum of 30% of the value of your coated product. Must Only 30%, up to a maximum of 30%, can be that coating and other ingredients and so on that go into it. So that, that just gives you you know, the rules of origin are extremely complicated, but the UK has put together this facility that tells you exactly what the level of local production and processing must be in order for this product to be able to get the certificate of origin saying it is a South African product that can enter the UK with a 0% duty. Now, in this unusual situation where other countries have a 0% duty, you could bypass that because no matter which country it's coming from into the UK, there's a 0% duty. But it is always a good idea to ensure that you have that certificate of origin because often things can even change in the process of a shipment being on the sea. I've had situations where a product is on the sea your importer suddenly went bankrupt and it had to be shipped off you know, to another importer who perhaps is not uh, prepared. If you've got your pack of documents ready, you, you, you're able to do that switch very swiftly. Now there are further notes about the rules of origin and the next element that the UK government has brought in here that Charlie alluded to and is a major, major first non-tariff barrier that companies always uh, encounter is what are the issues that I have to comply with? Where do I find out where these rules say what I must do as far as, you know, the various compliances? And the compliance varies dramatically from product to product. 
So in this case, for the cashew nuts, obviously it's something that people are eating. So control of contaminants in foodstuffs. If you clicked on that, it will open up. And as Charlie has already said, with the UK having exited from the European Union, the majority of these regulations and standards that the UK was part of in the EU have been transposed immediately and directly into UK legislation. So the rules currently are almost identical if you're exporting to the UK as if you were exporting to the EU. These will change in due course as the UK exercises its sovereign right to make adjustments to its own internal regulatory environment. But you will see as you click on each of these, the various elements open up. So if you're, if you're providing a food product, then chemical residues, pesticide residues, and so on. It, anybody who's in the agricultural field will know how vital these are and what a challenge it can be to actually find them. But they're all brought together there. Health control of foodstuffs of non-animal origin, if your product is genetically modified, these are the regulations have to comply with, the labeling of foodstuffs. Um, if you are a seed provider or you're sending cuttings of, of plants and so on to the UK, there's special rules there. As I say, we don't need to go through the detail of each of these, but the point is that that is really valuable information. Now, Leah mentioned that, um, I will also cover the TFSA School of Export, and I'm sorry, I know I'm running a bit over time already, but if you will allow me that um, little bit of extra leeway. Um, very, very important, we, th we feel, especially for um, members in the CEDA network and circle, CEDA providing excellent training. I, uh, anybody who hasn't seen it, they've also got some of their online stuff there that I, I, I thought just to show up for what CEDA provides. But once you've gone beyond getting your business ready and getting your local business processes in place, the reality is as soon as you start thinking about export, your whole dynamic changes. It's the, the level of complication, um, payment, orders, processing, packaging, labeling, shipping, insuring payment and so on is hugely different in international trade than it is in local markets. So. If you clicked on this link on the TFSA um, Trade and Information Hub, you'll see the TFSA School of, Info, uh, School of Export. It brings you through to this page. You can click in, you can register yourself, and it will bring you through to creating an account. It's a very simple process. Your name, you create a username, your details, the same sort of uh, standard registration process. And it will then bring you through, once you're registered, to a course library. There's seven modules there at the moment. You'll see one, two, three, four, and then if you go to page two, the six, five, six, and seven will come up. We are in the process right this week in contracting to have another 21 modules developed um, so that there will be 28 modules in place covering comprehensively what you need to know to embark on exporting. And it is completely free of charge and it's digital. So you can do it as a self-paced thing. 24 seven, anytime. It'll bring you through, you click on any one of those modules. I just took Inco terms, for example, and this is what it does. It, you, you'll find a little video there and you can scroll back and forward in, once you've completed the video, there's a quiz to test your understanding of the knowledge of, of, that you've been acquiring and so on. And you know, there are seven modules there. You can go backwards and forwards in it. You can do uh, if you want to go back to the video, you can watch the video and there are little quizzes and knowledge reinforcing um, processes. Very, very interactive. We piloted it with Future Females, a cohort of women from Future Females last year. As Leah said, we have a very, very strong focus and emphasis on getting more women involved in international trade. I'll be careful how I say this. The reality is women tend to be in many ways better, more empathetic and more relationship focused than men can be sometimes. And more and more women are coming through as being highly effective in international trade. So we have a strong focus on building capability of women in trade. And uh, this has all been designed. This is not some like myself, an old 
white man presenting. We've done it in such a way that it appeals to everybody across the board, men, women, whatever gender you identify as and from whichever country you're coming uh, from, but particularly in South Africa, that is available to, to everybody. Um, as I say, free of charge, and I would strongly encourage everybody to go onto the TFSA website. There are additional resources in our resources page here. There are additional export knowledge guides that we're bringing in, um, toolkit resources. There's a reference library with external, you know, with additional material, and then even external uh, um, training resources. If you decided to go and qualify further, there are other external training agencies. And we are particularly focused in this region, the International Trade Institute of Southern Africa. They are the people that we are working with to build this exporter training. And I can assure you, it is benchmark global best. The woman involved there used to chair the um, International Trade Training Organizations, global organization, and she is still on their accreditation platform. So it's highly uh, um, topical training delivered in a way that is not academic, but very, very business oriented. Leah, sorry, I have gone over time there. I do apologize. Let me uh, take down my uh, presentation then, and we can go through to any questions and answers generally and or about the, our, our trading information hub and the learning platform. Thank you very much. Robert, seeing the number of hands and the, and the, and the clapping of hands that are coming up on the chat session, I think we can forgive you for going over time. You know, I've got about 68 questions that oh. is um, in the chat, in the Q&A box. So can I ask both you um, and uh, Charlie, is it okay if I can edit all these questions and just send the most pertinent ones to both of you, if you can just populate the Excel spreadsheet that I send. So when I send the recording out to the participants, I will send them the, the Excel spreadsheet also with your questions answered. Rather than doing it now, you take your time, you answer it. I'll give you a day or two max because I would like to send the recording out while it's still fresh in everybody's mind. Um, Charlie, are you okay with that? Leah? Hello. Um, I, I, I may struggle. I'm actually uh, I'm actually going to be away. I'm, I'm leaving uh, to go on traveling to, across the region shortly after this. So uh, we might I might struggle to help with all of them, but maybe I can tried to help with a few of those now, or if there are some of the most pertinent ones, I can see if okay. there's someone else in the submission who can, um, who can help, but I, uh, I don't want to, um, I don't want to pro promise we'll be able to answer, answer everything, but I'll, uh, I'll try my best. Okay, let me, let me do that. Um, Mr. Mahole, did you have something to say? I was going to say maybe some people about five or six. Okay. In the interest I'll... of time, and uh, maybe they can be answered now, and then the rest will uh, concentrate on them uh, in, in, as, as we go uh, throughout right. the week. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Maybe then I, I'll just pull, pull up a few questions, uh, depending on the time, then we will decide. Um, okay. I am into the household decorative items and costume jewelry made uh, with Shreshwe fabric. Are there any limitations on materials that may not be exported to the UK? What about customers, uh, customs and excise on items about above types and how are they calculated by material weight currency value? Um, maybe I can jump in on that. Um, this is exactly the kind of question that um, comes up that we try to you know, that the, the trade and information hub is intended to serve in those links there. So with that last example, if you go onto the UK, what we call the trade help desk um, website, that's that one that was linked that I showed you. Um, and you put in your, your HS code for your product and it will bring up there, it will tell you what the customs duty is, what the taxes are, um, and it'll give you, so for example, if if there's a, a factory in China making shui shui material, I know there are a lot of them in China making it now as well, you will see the difference if it was coming in from China or India or somewhere else compared to the, the custom duty coming from South Africa. And then you'll also see the rules of origin. If you happen to have imported the shui shui material from outside the Southern African Customs Union or Mozambique, 
it will tell you how much transformation local value addition has to be applied to that so that if you're importing the material and you are now converting into dresses and shirts and or, or, or a, a matching top and trousers or something like that the level of processing that has to be involved and that goes to including even things like the value of the buttons that were low so local locally sourced the value of the threads for sewing that was locally sourced any other additional and even to some extent the packaging and you'll see even there they talk about how the valuation occurs and that kind of valuation information is something that is also going to be covered in the um, further export training modules because customs valuation can it, it's kind of standardized mostly around the world um, but there can be slight variations usually the customs duty is 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 placed on the, the the value landed in the country of destination and that's commonly called the cif cost insurance and freight but it it you know you'll see for the uk specifically for that product what the tax is what the duties are what the level of processing is to be able to um, be eligible for the reduced duty and then the level of of uh, um, processing and then the same kind of thing if there are chemicals on the on the uh, the material and so on there's all that you know fire retardancy and so on that is there in those rules and regulations of compliance in that same page i hope that gives you a, a good lead i would strongly encourage you to go onto the tfsa website and you will find that information you can view videos that we put up there both our own recordings as well as from the international trade center on how you can use some of these tools so I hope that answers sufficiently. I see Charlie's on. I don't know if you want to add something to that, Charlie. Okay. Um, somebody here is asking about export license. May I please request that um, you address all export license queries to uh, SARS. When I send the recording for, for the session, I will send you the contact person that you can contact at SARS um, regarding export license, and he would be able to assist you further. Um, can I jump in there as well quickly, yes. Leo, as well? Sorry. Um, no, please do, sir. <laughs> thank you. Something else that is going up very, very soon on the TFSA Trade and Information Hub is we've put up a quick export guide on a number of different topics. One of them is registration as an exporter in South Africa. So you'll be able to, I, 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 I will put my head on a block about this. Within two weeks, that guide will be up. And as Leo says, that comes from uh, SARS, but the, you know, we, the, there's a quick guide, a one pager, just to give you a, a, a follow through on what has to happen so that even before you talk to SARS, you know the process to anticipate with them. So thanks, Leo, sorry. That, that will be up on our, our, our website again within about two weeks, I think. We're just going through the finalization to, to, to get FCDO, our funders, to approve before we actually hang it on the hub. That will go up fairly shortly. Thank you very much. So that's an, a double whammy for our uh, participants. <laughs> um, here's a question here. They've got an online store with lots of requests from UK and other countries, and their biggest challenge is distribution. How best can they get their products to the UK? Please share opportunities available in respect to fashion industry. Um, again, um, there's, there's, I, see, there's always... I see question marks swimming around Charlie's head. <laughs> um, you know, there, 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 there are a number of routes to different things. Um, it's very much around the fashion industry. I would strongly encourage anybody who's in the fashion industry, again, to go to the TFSA Trade and Information Hub, and you will find the um, Center for Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries that's in the, the Netherlands. You will find a huge amount of information there on the fashion industry, how to connect with buyers, how to approach buyers, because you can't just pick up a phone and, and, you know, and say, buy my product. It's how to set yourself up in advance for that. There's exceptionally good guidance and leads there. And uh, as I say, because the EU is so freshly out of, the, and the UK is so freshly out of the uh, EU, most of the leads and information and they even give you a industry associations, industry journals, and so on that you can find.
contact. And again, specifically for the UK, you go to the ITC tools that I showed you, and you'll be able to pick up on potential buyers from that page that I showed you just now that will actually bring up the name, the company, who you talk to, telephone number, turnover number of employees and so on. So two leads there, go to the CBI page um, on our website and go to that page on finding buyers. I hope that helps. I don't know if Charlie had any Thank other you. thoughts. Um, <laughs> is there a UK website um, for compliances that people, uh, that our participants can look out for? Is it something on the Trade Forward Southern Africa web page? Yes, indeed. It's that, 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 it's that last one that I showed you. If you go onto our, um, if I can share my screen again, um, where we go. If we go to the um, home page of the um, Chief SA website, if you go to the standards and processes, if you clicked on that, it will bring you through to a, a page that covers, you know, global standards and so on globally. So globally in the EU, that's the EU My Access to Markets page, and the UK one that I was just demonstrating for you, the lookup tariffs and taxes and rules. You click on start, put in South Africa, put in your product, and it'll tell you, it will bring you to all those uh, compliance pages that we were, rules that we were talking about here, um, according to your product. Now this dram varies dramatically, you know, food products and clothing product, different rules. But this fabulous thing about this UK trade help desk that is linked to on the website is that it tells you what the rules and regulations are that you have to comply with under all of these different categories for your particular product. And I, for anybody who's um, you know, starting in export, I don't want to scare you away, but it, there are some products where in order to get your product exported from your country and into another country, you can actually have literally 150 to 200 different documents that you have to have ready for clearance through in the importing side. So the, the, the advantage of this is you don't know where else to start to find these tools. And these, these are brought to you right there and then. So that, that's not a tool from Trade Forward Southern Africa. It's a tool provided by the UK government. It's on the UK Gov website, but I know people find it difficult to find where it is. So that's why we brought the link directly into the TFSA Trade and Information Hub there on rules, processes, and so on. And you will see for the UK, you can click onto it. It takes you directly to there. If you're looking for the EU one, it'll take you to the EU one that I haven't shown you today. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here with regards to uh, what are the products that are high in demand in the UK? I think the same tool would be applicable. They can just search on the tool. That question has been answered. Um, here's a question. I'd like to check this platform could connect us with investors who are keen to invest in infrastructure development in the Red Meat Hub for international export. Should there be that space? I'd like to be connected with the investors. So I think they're looking at options. Is there an option for investors in specific sectors and uh, specific with specific products, basically? I think I need to divert to Charlie on that. He mentioned something earlier. Um, yes, sure, sure. There, there, there most certainly is. So, so in terms of tools available, um, I mentioned the uh, deal, both the deal room earlier and grow, growth gateway um, that would provide access to uh, a, a platform to advertise such opportunities and even a link to such investors. Um, in, indeed, to be honest, if there if there are particular projects, be people you know, want to link up with UK investors as well. That's something always that the Department of International Trade here in South Africa would be very happy to hear about. Again, you can find details online, or if you don't have it already, I'm happy to share about afterwards and we can connect you with the with, with the right people. So that's always something we're, um, uh, we're happy to hear about. And then um, we can connect with uh, people in the UK accordingly for that. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, while you were doing your presentation, somebody was also dressing you. So there's here an offer. Um, we ma they make handcrafted accessories, including ties, pocket squares, bow ties, using mainly locally sourced material. We think our ties would suit you very well, sir. So there's a that's actually a proposition for you for um, well-marketed 
to Polka.coco, well marketed, my my Pumzile. Well done to you. That's a she trade. That's a she trade <laughs> client. So well done. I see that she's really uh, picking up some pointers when it comes to marketing her products. Um, we tried to get into <laughs> the well UK with products. nutritional <laughs> with u- nutritional supplements for animals, um, and they're requesting for assistance. Can I? Um, ask is it possible when i send out the recording of this this presentation um would it be possible if i could uh, cc and provide your email addresses so that if they've got any questions they can contact um, either of you directly would that be allowed yeah I I just, I've may, not... maybe... sorry go sorry, on, carry on charlie carry on I was just saying, maybe maybe what we can do afterwards as well is we can provide you a whole host of links and then the right contact points for all the different things because probably that will be much more direct uh, direct to get to different people and different sources of information. So maybe that's something we can do with our afterwards. Otherwise, it might be a bit um, a bit slow to going through uh, ju- just Rob and I. That will probably uh, be more help to people. Yeah. Sure. Okay. If I, if I can just chip in from our side there as well, you know, the way our program is set up is um, because we work across all six countries in the region, it'd be very, very difficult for us to deal one on one with companies, <laughs> which is why we work through business support organizations like CEDA. So what I, what, what I can suggest from, from, from our side is that you're going to pull up the question uh, Q&A and pass them through to us. We'll try and, you know, address those. That's what we usually do in our process as well. And um, what I can do is I can try to, if you know, if there's a particular thing there, I can try to add in the link directly to where they can get the information um, and or say, okay, in this instance, um, let you and I engage and we try and do it and then you can pass that information on as much as anything we want to we we're in a position where we're we're a three-year program and we our intent is that the BSOs like CEDA and Chambers of Commerce and the export agencies we, we we're simply there to try to help focus exporters attention to know that you are the people to go to not tfsa because we won't be here in three years so if we can go through that process i'll try and answer the questions as best i can in that q a and can pass it on if there's something that we can't then maybe you and i can engage so that it that that cedar is providing the support as opposed to us providing the support if i can if if you follow that sure thank you very much i've just I've just put up the poll results. Thank you very much for the immense um, uh, support and the feedback that you've given. Um, I am glad to see that uh, we have gotten the distinction for the webinar and the information has been accepted well. So I will share that with uh, you, uh, with Charlie and and Robert for future. Um, Now it's 11.58, so I would like to just round up uh, because we are really running out of time. Within this rapidly changing scenario, exporters in developing countries seeking international markets are limited by a number of challenges. These include a lack of appropriate market, product and technology related information, the need to meet and demonstrate compliance with quality standards, buyers requirements, trade regulations, tariffs and non-tariff barriers are exacerbated by limited access to finance. Support services provided by national agencies such as CEDA and its stakeholders such as Trade Forward South Africa often go unnoticed or even underutilized. Result is that you as the potential exporter often find it difficult to export successfully and consistently. Most adopt a traditional product focused approach, receiving an order, fulfilling it and then closing the sale. This approach may work in the short term but too often leaves the exporter at the mercy of price competition with little room for differentiation. On this basis, even when an exporter succeeds at market entry, it is unable to maintain a long-term presence. May I urge the participants to tap into the resources that are provided. Do your homework, ask questions, and gain knowledge in the field that you would like to succeed in and take your business to be sustainable. Writer Seth Gordon once said, There's no shortage of remarkable ideas. What's missing is the will to execute them. Having said that, may I take this opportunity to thank the British High Commission and especially Mr. Charlie Morris, the Trade Forward Southern Africa. Special thanks to Mr. Robert Moody and Ms. Zintle Fakati 
for their continuous support. It is much appreciated. To the participants, we at CEDA trust that we were able to provide a great information sharing session through this webinar. You have a blessed day and a week ahead, and I thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Leah and uh, Ambrose. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Mr. Moody. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Thank Moody. Thank you, Charlie.